And welcome back to African Perspective with me, Aldrin Simpia. The General Counsel of the World Trade Organization called it a very significant moment for the global body after the selection of Nigeria's Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela. As the first African and female Director General, the former Senior World Bank official and Nigeria's former Finance Minister was the consensus peak after an outmuscling South Korean's candidate, Yu Myung Hee, who withdrew her candidacy earlier on this month. But now, it's the dawn of a new day, and the real work can begin. Today, WTO members are making history. For the first time in the 73 years of GATT and WTO, you are selecting a woman and an African as Director General. This is groundbreaking and positive. I'm grateful for the trust you have in me, not just as a woman and an African, but also in my knowledge, experience, and as some of you have said, courage and passion to work with you to undertake the wide-ranging reforms the WTO needs to reposition itself for the future. So who is Dr. Ngozi Okonje Iwela and what does her historical appointment mean for global trade and her home continent's own development? Joining me um, this evening to make sense of this a bit later on, we will be joined by Nigeria's Federal Ministry's Trade and Industry Director, who will be joining us a bit later on. But for now, we are joined by Mkolisi, that is Mkolisi Ngulube, who is a researcher on international and economic law. Good evening and welcome to um, African Perspective. Mkolisi, thank you so much for making time for us. Good evening, Aldrin. Thank you so much for inviting me. Let's start off there um, with um, just making sense of what her appointment means. But first of all, who is um, Dr. Ngozi? Well, I think we all know Dr. Ngozi is a tried and tested leader. She was second in charge at the World Bank for years. Uh, she's proven herself to, and also she has a financial minister uh, in Nigeria for two different presidents. Um, so she's a woman who's capable. She's a woman who's been in charge. She's a woman who's led um, through difficult times, both at the World Bank and in Nigeria. So she's a tried and tested leader. Uh, with regards to what her appointment means, um, appointment is an interesting one. One, it means that there's clearly a willingness amongst WTO members to work towards finding solutions. Mm. Uh, as you remember, as you know, the last... Um, the last American president had blocked her appointment. Yeah. Uh, however, the new uh, Biden and Harris administration has sort of given the green light and supported her, which for me indicates that the, the WTO members are really willing to work towards finding solutions for the current crisis that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the interesting aspect of, of, of um, her candidacy as well, considering that she was also running against another a female. And for me, I wonder what this means about the conversations that would be happening within the council as well. Well, I think this one for the first time where we have uh, women in leadership position at the WTO. We've had one of the women that she was running with um, was once uh, a chairperson for the DSP. So the, the WTO is used to having women leaders. However, we've not had a DG. So we've not had a woman at the most highest position in the WTO, but we are not unfamiliar with having women leaders. Yeah. Uh, so her appointment is going to be very interesting. She is African. She is black. But she wasn't just selected because she's African and black. She was appointed and selected because she's African, she's black, she's capable, and she's led in international institutions as well as at home. Yeah. And in that uh, post, post, the, post um, the, 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 the announcement about her appointment, she speaks about, sure, um, even, even before um, this whole appointment, she already had 162 countries, member states, that were endorsing a candidacy. What does that t also tell us about the confidence that has been shown in her already, even without speaking about the Trump administration? I think it's impressive. I think it's impressive that she had already the support of 162 uh, member states of the WTO. It shows that they've got confidence in her skills and her abilities, and they understand that it's time for a change, that business cannot continue as usual at the WTO. We need change and we need uh, steady leadership, but leadership that's also not off uh, the trading sector, because I think that's interesting. She's an economist. She's worked at the World Bank at a different institution. Um, so they've got someone from the outside. And I think that's also a good indicator that they are willing to 
to go with the times and accept change and really uh, look for invigoration within the organization and the institution. Mm-hmm. And as she walks into this institution as well, she says that one of her priorities is to deal with making sure that the countries, especially low developing countries and developing countries, get access to COVID-19 vaccines. And I wonder whether her role on Gavi would help her position um, and play more influence around making sure that there is access to those vaccines. It would, uh, because she's got some expertise with regards to access to medicines. However, as a DG, she's got to balance a very, she's sort of played a very intricate role where she balances out her own views and that of remaining impartial. Because in many ways, she's not just serving developing or least developing countries. She's the DG for all 164 member countries. Therefore, what this means is that she can facilitate the process and she can ensure that there's a platform for members to come to this conclusion, but she herself cannot be the main driver alone. She needs to buy in the support, because as we always say in, in the WTO, it's a member-driven organization. Therefore, you need to buy in the support of the members first. And once you've got that and they buy and they believe in you, only then can you really bring about change. So she needs to play a really delicate balancing uh, exercise in that regard. She can't take the forefront, so to speak, mm-hmm. but she needs to create an environment conducive enough for members to reach this agreement on their own. And actually speaking about that, she's quite clear about the role that she has and the position that she holds. There was a question that uh, was asked about uh, what role and influence does she, she think she'll be able to play when it comes to the implementation of the African continental free trade area. And just take a listen to what she had to say, especially at the beginning of that answer as well. And of course, you know, as a as a DG and the DG for all members, and must work to advance the interests of every single member. But that being said, Africa is at a unique juncture where it's, it's agreed one of the largest. Uh, it has uh, imp- it's implementing one of the largest free trade agreements uh, in the world, and it has a long term vision uh, of perhaps having a, a complete free trade area on the continent. And so the issue is, uh, what are the sticking points? Where can the WTO be useful? Well, I I, I, I want to say immediately that the WTO rules and the WTO institution has been an inspiration for the design of part of the of the uh, African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement. Uh, so the WTO has al- already lent its body of institutional knowledge and wisdom to help design this, but. Building on that, we need to see what are the capacity constraints in implementing this. Can we use aid for trade to support the, the secretariat of, uh, of the AFC FTA? Uh, can we find uh, you know technical assistance where it's needed to help break any log jams? The second way is in the, the, the WTO is working on an investment facilitation uh, uh, agreement. I think working, pushing that hard and trying to see how we get investment into the continent will be very important and we'll do absolutely everything to try and facilitate that. The continent also must do its part to make conditions hospitable uh, for investment to come in. But I think, for example, if you look at the area of pharmaceutical products, we import more than 90% of the pharmaceuticals we use on the continent. So how can we help facilitate investment so that uh, we can have on the continent the ability to manufacture more of our medical uh, products uh, and commodities. Uh, And the WTO looking at what we can do on the investment side will be uh, uh, very, very important. Working with other organizations in partnership like the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, the World Bank and so on. Well, there you have it, Mkolisi. She understands the role that she plays. She understands her position as well as the Director General, but also um, taking note of some of the stumbling blocks, perhaps, that the Secretariat would be facing, and also some of the shortcomings that we have as a continent. Yes. She, she clearly understands that, and I couldn't have said it better myself. She's aware that her she's, she's the DG of the WTO and that she can assist African countries to the extent that they need assistance in regards to capacity building and technical assistance because in their capacities as members of the WTO. She, she herself can't be involved in the FCFTA 
So I think she understands that intricate balance and she understands her role perfectly. And this will stand her in good stead, especially since she's taking over an organization that is really under difficult constraints at the moment. Mm-hmm. And what about that aspect that you also raise is about 90, 90% of pharmaceutical investments are, be, sorry, are being imported, 90% of pharmaceutical products rather are being imported into the continent. And I think that's more glaring now because of COVID-19. Yes, definitely. COVID-19 has really uh, shown us some of the weaknesses that we have as a continent, uh, and we should have learned from the AIDS crisis. Uh, so Africa and India were one of the leading countries towards pushing for compulsory licensing within the TRIPS agreement uh, in order to allow members to create generic drugs uh, locally. Uh, however, we haven't really made progress as developing countries and the global south. Um, and we should have made progress over the years where we should have really started producing our own pharmaceuticals. So hopefully after this crisis, because I would like to think that the AIDS crisis in 2002 was a warning shot. And this is the final uh, this is the final warning shot. So if you don't listen to her and you don't listen to what's happening at the moment, um, we will be in a precarious position. Yeah. And we're just putting up a tweet now from Amina Mohammed who says that congratulations, warm congratulations to uh, Ngozi okonjo newly appointed Director General of the WTO. You are blazing new trails as the first woman and first African to lead the WTO. You inspire us. Um, the UN looks forward to working with you to keep the promise of the SDGs for people and for the planet. And that is something that she also said is quite close to our heart. Yes, she did. Uh, in her address, uh, the incoming DG was very clear that she's really interested in pushing uh, the fisheries agreement yeah. um, and ensuring that uh, an, an agreement is reached among members, and that's in line with one of the SDGs for sustainable development. Uh, so she's clearly, and it's, it's interesting that Dr. Amina Mohammed, who herself uh, was the chairperson of DSP a few years ago at the WTO, supports and endorsed this woman so publicly. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's just quickly then play another clip from um, that press briefing that was held after her election or after the appointment or the announcement, rather, um, that she will be the new DG of um, the World Trade Organization, where she also spoke about the organization that she walks into and the biggest battle, which would be the issue around how to settle disputes within the organization and also how perhaps the organization may have lost its persuasive power. The uh, reform of the appellate body will, is not going to be um, um, uh, an easy one, um, but there have been specific criticisms of the appellate body. Um, it, it, it looks to me like the work done by Ambassador Walker and all show that the majority of members would like to see a two-step dispute settlement mechanism, including the appellate body. But we need to talk to our members to make sure this is Okay, unfortunately, um, we, had a, we had a bit of a pause in that clip there. But she, but she speaks about some of the concerns that have been raised about the appellant body and how, for instance, that the argument that has come even from the United States that, hey, listen, you are now interpreting law when that is not the role that you should be playing. So I should probably put a caveat uh, here and say I've worked at the appellate body. Therefore, some of my opinions <laughs> are I just that and they represent my opinion. Uh, <laughs> but over the last few years, the appellate body has been criticized for some of the decisions that it's, it's taken. However, I would like to warn people that some of the criticism has been by countries who's been at the receiving end of unfavorable judgments by the appellate body. This is not to say that there isn't merit in some of the, the complaints that have been that some of the complaints that have been lodged by members. I think in some in some ways the appellate body has um, acted as a gap filler uh, in the WTO, and the reason why the appellate body has acted as a gap filler, unfortunately, is because the negotiating arm of the WTO has failed. So we haven't had a full, complete negotiation round since Doha in 2002. Therefore, what you get is members going to the appellate body 
needing the appellate body to essentially settle disputes that ordinarily would not fall within their ambit, but would fall within the negotiating arm, aka the political arm of the appellate of the WTO. But because that arm has failed and that arm isn't functional, a lot of that is sort of been pushed towards the appellate body. Mm -hmm. So the appellate body over the years has had to really play a really difficult role of adjudicating and sometimes overstepping, but not overstepping out of choice, but because it's been forced and been put in such a, a, a precarious position. Yeah. Um, and also, you must admit that some of the so-called complaints that have been put forward, especially by the United States, are politically influenced. Uh, for the longest of time, the United States was, uh, or still is, actually, the number one bringer of cases into the WTO, uh, especially into the appellate body. They appeal the most. Um, and they win most of their cases. However, when they lose, which is in the minority of times, uh, they want to express um, their disdain and their dislike of the appellate body. Yeah. But it's a system that when it favors them, they are fully behind. But when it doesn't favor them, they are a bit skeptical. So yeah. I'm not sure. I think, I think we should take all criticism of AB with a pinch of salt. Okay. And, and then w w one of the issues that you also raise in the clip, um, unfortunately, that clip got cut there, is around the turnaround time that um, ordinarily you'd hope to have everything, um, all settlements in within 90, I think she said 90 days. However, though, now it yeah. takes up to two years. Alvin, um, again, I want to reiterate, as someone who's worked at the appellate body, uh, the appellate body is a, essentially a court, and it's staffed by a secretariat of 40 or so lawyers, uh, and they deal with over 80 cases at times. Um, and when you are having a high, and this is the thing, members have been appealing a lot of the, of the panel, panel decisions. When they appeal these decisions, that's increased the workload of the appellate body. So the, work, the appellate body can't function normally within the 90 days uh, time limit with 40 lawyers. At the moment, we don't even have enough uh, appellate body members to form a quorum, but what now we would have seven members. So if, for example, members extended their appellate body to at least maybe 15 members, uh, 15 appellate body members instead of the, the traditional seven, mm -hmm. uh, they increase the staff, perhaps the turnaround time of 90 days would be feasible. However, the appellate body on average produces a report uh, of like 200 pages. And this report is done after many steps, after hearings, after circulating a, an interim report to the members for comments, and then sending it back, then sending it to the DSP. So it's not, it's not that the appellate body was failing out of not trying. The appellate body was, was not failing necessarily. It was failing because of how effective it was. Members had so much confidence in the appellate body that they would appeal but those appeals would stack up. So it's really a numbers game and a staffing game, in my opinion. So if the members really want the appellate body to decide in 90 days, they're prescribed by the working rules, the members must just strengthen the appellate body and increase the number of appellate body members. Do, do you think that the rules around consensus perhaps is also a stumbling block? The rules around consensus are, are, are interesting. So that the WTO has many... Um, decision-making processes and procedures, consensus being one of them, but it's not the only one. But over the years, the members have gotten accustomed to making decisions via consensus. And for some reason, members seem to have forgotten that if consensus fails in certain situations, they can resort to voting. Those members don't want to resort to voting. For example, with the blockage of the appointment of appellate body members, it's very clear from the DSU, which is the Dispute Settlement Understanding, the agreement that sort of guides uh, the appointment of appellate body members and the whole dispute settlement, it's very clear that when, you, when there is no consensus, in order to appoint members, you can vote. And in voting, you only require a 75% majority. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the incoming DG has already pointed out that one of things that she's really going to focus on is consensus and decision making within the WTO. Because I think one or two things need to happen. Either members need to realize and go back to read the agreements that they've drafted that remind them that decision making is not only done through negative or positive consensus, that it can be done through um, um, voting. And that in certain instances where consensus is the only requirement, that they perhaps must consider amending um, amending the, the, the agreements. Because in all honesty, um, 
Aldrin, it is impossible for an organization of 164 members and counting, by the way, to agree every time. But it's possible for a majority to agree. Yeah. Because this requiring everyone to agree really does is responsible for much of the impasse that we forced, we are facing right now. Uh, for example, the appellate body of the, the appointment of the DG herself was really being withheld by two members. Yeah. By one, essentially, but it was that was the only member that was withholding her support. She had the support of every single other, of all the other members. So okay. it's not practical. It's not feasible. Okay, let's just quickly go to an ad break. When we come back, we'll um, also chat about uh, some of um, those possible reforms that the WTO would need to look at. Um, let's quickly read this tweet here from uh, Dr. Mpumzile Mlambonuga, who is a UN Women um, Director, who says that the IWD 2021 and the SWEF, I can't see that correctly, we are all about women's leadership as we gear up to celebrate the occasion. Let's uplift and recognize women making um, history or her history, uh, her, her story rather. Congratulations to Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela from Nigeria, who is appointed as the next WTO Director General. Wishing you all the best.